Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jabro. I'm a portfolio analyst with Tricom Funding. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to the staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Jen Erb. For over 15 years, Jen has been committed to talent strategies in the human resources profession. Her career started in the staffing and recruiting industry, which was the foundation for expanded growth into corporate HR. She was most recently head of HR for a community financial institution for 12 years. In this role, she applied human resource strategy to earn the company an award as one of the best places to work in Ohio based on employment practices and employee engagement. She is currently the managing director for HR services at Talon Resources. She assists clients with all aspects of human resources including HR strategic planning, HR project management, recruitment strategy, selection process plans, compensation plans, performance management plans, training, employee relations, and employment policies. She has been on the board of directors for industry and field associations for over 10 years, most recently the Human Resources Association of Central Ohio. The U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, responsible for the enforcement of federal discrimination laws, reports that in 2013, nearly 100,000 job bias charges were filed against employers, with more than 372 million collected for victims of workforce or workplace harassment. Knowledge, training, and developed policies and procedures are a company's best prevention tools against workplace harassment and discrimination claims. Jen will discuss the following in today's webinar. Federal discrimination law, Title VII, reporting, investigation, and discipline, liability, and responsibility. By the end of today's session, you'll have a better understanding of discrimination laws, employer responsibilities, and learn best practice prevention techniques. If you have any questions during today's webinar, please feel free to submit your question using either the Q&A feature or the chat feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. With that, I'll turn the floor over to Jen. Thank you so much, Amanda. Can everybody hear me okay? If not, send a message through the Q&A or the chat. Okay, Sounds so we're gonna get started. Are you able to hear me okay, Amanda? I am, thank you. Great, thank you. Just wanna make sure before we get moving too far along. I know I've had that happen before. So let's just uh, dive right into the training today. As Amanda said, we're gonna discuss preventing and understanding sexual harassment and other forms of harassment and discrimination. The great part about this training is it's specifically for owners, executives, managers, and supervisors. So it's gonna satisfy that regular training required by federal laws. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about those federal laws, as Amanda said, as we get into the presentation. But more importantly here, what I want to do is help you improve your compliance. So building stronger policies and procedures uh, to keep us out of trouble with employment laws. So some of the things that we're gonna to cover today, again, as Amanda said, those federal discrimination laws, we're gonna focus on Title VII, because in that uh, we'll discuss sexual harassment and the definitions of sexual harass harassment, adverse tangible action and hostile work environment. We'll also discuss who is a victim, because that's important to understand when uh, we determine a sexual harassment or harassment and discrimination situation. More than just sexual harassment, we're gonna understand other harassment and discrimination, and we're also gonna review some examples of harass 
harassing and discriminating behavior. Uh, we're going to talk about case su studies throughout the webinar, so you have a good understanding of um, a harassing and discriminating situation when you're faced with it. Uh, in each law, there's anti-retaliation clauses, so we're going to emphasize anti-retaliation. Anti we're going to also talk about what to do when a situation comes up, so the reporting, inv investigation, and disciplinary process. Also, your liability as an organization, your responsibility as a manager, an employer, and then what managers should do when when they're faced with these situations. So the federal discrimination laws, um, quite a few of them. The first and main law is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. And this is the one that focuses on prohibiting employment discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. There's also the Equal Pay Act, referred to as the EPA, not the Environmental Protection Agency, but this is a different EPA. And it protects men and women who perform substantially equal work in the same establishment from sex-based wage discrimination. Uh, you may have heard, you know, equal pay for equal work. Age Discrimination and Employment Act, the ADEA, it prohibits uh, individuals who are 40 years and older from discrimination. Notice that I said 40 years and older. There's a misnomer out there that protections are only for 50 and older. The law actually covers individuals 40 and older. Title VII and Title V of the Americans with Disabilities Act refers to as the ADA and also the amendment, which is the ADAAA, and it prohibits employment discrimination against qualified individuals with disabilities in the private sector and in state and local governments. There's also a law, the Rehabilitation Act, with, which covers uh, individuals with disabilities in the federal government. Title II of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, commonly referred to as GINA, prohibits employment discrimination based on genetic information about an applicant, employee, or former employee. I frequently get questions about what, what is GINA and how would that apply? So I'd like to just give an example here. So uh, maybe you have a new hire uh, and they're interested in life insurance. So they fill out a medical history questionnaire for the life insurance policy benefit something that's very common uh, for a new hire to do when they're enrolling in their benefits. The medical history questionnaire for the policy is permitted. An insurance company can ask for that information in order to um, let that employee buy additional life insurance through the group policy. But that medical history information on that form may not be used to make an employment decision. So, how would that come into play? Um, maybe not promoting the individual to a management position in the future because the company is concerned that, quote, she may have medical issues in the future and wouldn't be able to handle the stress and time commitments of the position. That would be illegal. So you have to be aware of the information that you have available to you and be sure not to use illegal information for employment decisions. And the last one there is uh, Civil Rights Act of 1991. Uh, among other things, it provides monetary damages in cases of intentional employment discrimination. So uh, that law just really raises the bar uh, as far as the costs associated with not following the law. So these are the federal laws. You want to note that you're going to have state and local laws that apply as well. Uh, as these federal laws. So for example, sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination is prohibited in many states. Now that is not in the federal law currently, but there are a slew of states that also have um, sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination laws on their books. So you want to make sure you check with um, not only your state laws, but also your local laws. So for your cities and counties that prohibit additional discrimination like sexual orientation and um, 
gender identity discrimination. So let's focus now on who's protected under the law. The law prohibits employers with at least 15 employees. Um, that's for Title VII, um, 20 employees for age discrimination. So that would include employment agencies and unions. So you want to include all of your temporary employees in that as well, your contract employees in that head count. Um, so it prohibits those covered employers from discriminating in employment based on race, color, religion, sex, which is also referred to as gender, national origin, disability, age, and genetic information. So these are what's referred to as the protected classes, meaning protection occurs as a result of discrimination or ha harassment because of the individual's class listed above. Therefore, the law doesn't protect everyone only those what's referred to as protected classes. So let's talk about an example of that. So if the company's president is a Democrat and you are a Republican, is it legal for him to fire you simply for being a Republican? Yes. Under federal law, it is. Now, there might be some state laws where maybe they have political affiliation um, protections. I'm not aware of those, but uh, yes, that is legal under federal law. Now, is firing you simply because you're Republican ethical? Well, no, I would contend no, uh, but it is not protected under federal law. So the point is that discriminating against individuals may be legal. It's only illegal when discrimination or harassment occurs because of the protected class is covered under the law. So you have to keep that in mind when individuals are coming to you uh, looking for protections under the law, uh, whether it's legal or illegal, and also consider the other spectrum. Is it ethical or unethical? And your practices and being a good employer. Now, the law perspective specifically uses the term discrimination, which is defined as tangible employment action. You'll hear this term quite a bit, meaning that employees suffer a tangible loss as a result of discriminatory actions of the employer. So for example, it may be shown that an employee did not receive pay raises because of their gender. That would be discrimination. So it has to be proven. And this could be proven by showing that employees that were male earned on average $2 more per hour than individuals in the same position and performance level than were females. So that would be wage discrimination against females. The other form of protection is harassment. You know, the term harassment isn't specifically in the law. Harassment is based on uh, terms in the law. So that the, the actual term harassment isn't in Title VII. What it says is it protects terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. And it's been case law that has further defined harassment. And so that's why we're going to cover quite a few cases today talking about what is harassment and examples of harassment so you have a good idea of what that looks like or could look like in the workplace. The law has defined two types of harassment in the workplace. One is adverse tangible action and the other is hostile work environment. An adverse tangible action is referred to as quid pro quo. Uh, that's just a Latin term that stands for this for that. Quid pro quo, this for that. Quid pro quo harassment is commonly recognized a form of harassment. It's pretty straightforward. So the definition from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC, is when job benefits are contingent on the provisions of sexual favors, usually uh, to a supervisor or an agent of the employer who has the authority to make decisions about employment actions. So job benefits would be 
anything related to employment, promotion, salary increases, shift or work assignments, performance expectations, and any other conditions of employment. The other type of quid pro quo is rejection of a sexual advance or a request for sexual favors, which results in tangible employment detriment or a loss of a job benefit. So the example of quid pro, quid pro quo is pretty, again, straightforward. A supervisor promises to give an employee, say, a promotion if she goes out with him on a date. Um, say somebody refuses to go out on a date with the manager, and then they take employment action against them. Say they fire that individual. That would be the second, the rejection of a sexual advance. I just re received a question. It says, is there a case law that clearly declares which employer, the lending or borrowing employer, is responsible for harassment claims in the temporary employment uh, employee situation? Um, it's both. You have co-employment in that particular situation. Um, and it, it really depends when you look at a case-by-case -case basis um, who has interactions so, for example, um, we're going to talk a little bit later um, who, uh, who the victim is and, and then who the harasser is. Uh, you may have a situation where your employee is on site and the harasser is the client's employee. So you're both involved in that particular situation. Um, so you're going to uh, work on those things together. Um, of course, whoever has the harassing employee has a greater concern, but you still have to solve the problem. I hope that answers your question. So you have co-employment um, concerns with all employment laws related to harassment and discrimination. Good question. Thank you. So the other form of harassment is what's called a hostile work environment. This is a claim demonstrating that the conditions of employment are harmed by the victim's treatment. So specifically in the EEOC guidelines for sexual harassment, sexual misconduct constitutes sexual harassment when such conduct has the purpose or effect of unreasonably interfering with an inv individual's work performance or creating an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. You'll hear that uh, quite a bit in discrimination law, creating an intimidating, hostile, or in offensive work environment. Um, that's the true definition of harassment under discrimination laws. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the next slide here because there's some considerations with defining hostile work environment. Um, hostile work, work environment is a little less straightforward than quid pro quo. Um, and the law states that discrimination occurs because of the individual's protected class. So to be, number one, a hostile work environment, it has to be because of the vic victim's protected class. So the courts have held that in order to establish what's called a prima facie case, um, that's to avoid dismissal. So it can't be dismissed if you have a prima facie case. In a hostile work environment claim, the plaintiff must prove that but for or because of the individual's gender, they would not have been the object of the harassment. So in applying this but for standard, the courts generally examine how the plaintiff was treated and determine if an employee of the opposite gender would have been treated any differently. So if so, if the uh, other gender would have been treated differently, then discriminatory treatment is presumed, and it's a prima facie case. So let's look at an example here. There was a case back in 1993 with COP versus Samaritan Health Systems. The employer claimed that Title VII had not been violated because, in their words, very interesting. They treated both its male and female employees in, a, in an offensive manner. Nice employer, huh? We treat everybody poorly. Um, but the court dug into it a little deeper. They said um, that not only did the offensive conduct involve more females than males, it was 10 females as compared to four males, 
but the offensive incidents involving the female employees were much more serious in nature than those involving the male employees. So, for example, several of the incidents involving win women included actual physical contact and harm being inflicted, whereas the incidents involving the male employees consisted of only raised voices or verbal insults. The court concluded that since the offensive treatment directed toward the female employees was far worse than the offensive treatment directed toward the male employees, that the female plaintiffs had met their burden of proving the offensive treatment they received was indeed be but for or because of their gender. It was different. They were treated differently. Um, other cases involving um, vulgar gender-based insults are generally automatic primi prim uh, prima facie cases. Uh, so note, uh, a good professional uh, pointer there is uh, if you have anybody using gender-based insults, address it right away. That's an automatic prima facie case for hostile work environment. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, what those insults are in other cases um, and also what to do when um, you're faced with a situation. So uh, the next bullet point there, the courts have defined hostile work environment to include a component of un unwelcomeness. So the victim must indicate by their words or conduct that sexual advances are unwelcome regardless of voluntary participation. So let me say that again. So if they say it's unwelcome, regardless of whether they participate in whether it's insults or sexual advances, unwelcome behavior is that behavior which the victim does not solicit or incite and is personally found to be unde undesirable or offensive. So it just simply takes someone saying, I don't want you to talk to me that way. I don't like to be talked to that way. I don't like to be touched that way. I don't, whatever. Um, <clears throat> there's uh, actually one of the first sexual harassment cases heard by the Supreme Court was Meritor Savings Bank versus Vinson. It was in 1986, and it really defined hostile work environment and this unwelcomeness and also brought in this component of voluntary participation. There was a female employee, Michelle Venson, and, and she had engaged in sexual intercourse with her supervisor for several years. And throughout this period of time, uh, Venson's supervisor, his name was Sidney Taylor, he repeatedly placed sexual demands on her, uh, both during and after business hours. Um, Michelle Venson refused Taylor's advances at First, but then she consented out of fear of losing her job, even though such threats were never explicitly made to her or against her. So he never said, you're going to lose your job. She just feared that she was going to lose her job. So Vincent... Uh, estimated that she and uh, Taylor had uh, sexual intercourse between 40 and 50 times over the next few years. Uh, Vincent also testified that Taylor uh, fondled her in front of other employees. He followed her into the women's restroom. When she went there alone, he exposed himself to her and even forcibly raped her on several occasions. So the defense that the employer used was that Vincent voluntarily participated in the ongoing affair with Taylor her supervisor. The court said no. Uh, they said that the correct inquiry in this case was whether Vincent indicated by her words or conduct that these sexual advances were unwelcome, not whether her actual participation in the sexual intercourse was voluntary. And one of the ways that they proved that, because she, uh, she had told coworkers that she physically vomited one time after being in contact with him uh, at at work, and so they they said that that was enough to show that uh, his his actions were unwelcome. So in the Meritor case, the Supreme Court stated that the victim must prove that the harassment was sufficiently severe and pervasive to alter the conditions of the of employment to the point that it creates an abusive working environment. 
the court contended that the mere utterance of an offensive sexual epithet by itself was not sexual harassment claim under Title VII. So saying it once shouldn't be tolerated. You should handle it, but it's not severe and pervasive enough to create a hostile work environment. But as managers, you know, you, you need to address every situation because when a situation is not addressed, it can snowball into an environment that eventually becomes hostile. So in a few slides, we'll review harassing behaviors that can lead to severe and pervasive hostile environments. So who's a victim? Um, it, it, generally, a, a, a victim in, in most people's eyes is seen as a woman. Um, that's where this started, was um, women and equal treatment. However, the, the case law has uh, expanded that definition to a man or a woman. And um, although it used to be a women's issue, uh, sexual harassment against men in the workplace is really on the rise. Sexual harassment charges filed by men have uh, doubled over the past two decades. And in 2011, they accounted for uh, about 16% of all sexual harassment charges filed with the EEOC. And um, they believe it's because of awareness. You know, employers are required to do training, um, have policies, and so be, men are becoming more comfortable lodging complaints, which they should, um, considering some of the cases that we'll hear here. I, there was one here uh, specifically male-on-male -male harassment. So it doesn't ha necessarily have to be a man um, against a woman or a woman against a man. Um, many male-on-male -male harassment cases involve illegal sexual orientation harassment, when a male employee is harassed for being gay or being perceived as gay. So in 1998, there was a U.S. Supreme Court uh, landmark ruling. The case was on Cal versus Sundown Sundowner Offshore Services. Um, Sundowner is an um, oil rig company. Uh, and the claim was for sexual harassment, where the harasser and the victim were the same gender. It was male on male. And they were working on an oil platform in the Gulf of Mexico. Joseph Oncow was sexually harassed by three coworkers, including his supervisor. Um, the perpetrators initially subjected Oncow to verbal assaults, but eventually the harassment escalated to public humiliation and actual physical attacks, including sexual assault. The Supreme Court noted in this case that um, while ordinary workplace horseplay or flirtation may not constitute harassment, when one employee's behavior toward another creates an objectively hostile or abusive work environment, then the behavior is legal, illegal under Title VII, regardless of the gender of the victim or the perpetrator. So that was male-on-male -male harassment, the first case in 1998. Um, there have also been um, uh, female-on-male harassment. Uh, a, a recent case was Austin Foam Plastics. They had to pay over $600,000 in 2010 to settle a lawsuit in which a female manager allegedly made unwelcome sexual comments toward and physical contact with male employees. And the men also alleged that the female manager had made sexual advances um, a condition for their gaining better employment terms. So it, it it goes all ways. And so when we think about who a victim may be, we also have to consider who the harasser is. And I mentioned this before. We've already discussed that the harasser could most definitely be a supervisor, and that's in quid pro quo, quid pro quo cases. Ugh, tongue-tied. But it could also be supervisor in another work area. Um, the harasser could also be an agent of the employer, meaning someone contracted by the employer, like an independent contractor or a vendor. Um, so in the question that uh, came up earlier, uh, if you have an employee working at another location, so it's your employee as the um, temporary agency working on site at your client, um, anybody at that client could be a harasser, 
whether it's coworkers, um, a manager at that client, uh, and everyone is responsible for those claims then. More so you as an employer, but you do have a co-employment responsibility because you have uh, a staffing contract involved there. Uh, let's see here. Um, so, you know, we've talked about several cases here where coworkers um, can harass by creating a hostile work environment. Um, you also want to be aware that a harasser may also be a non-employee, like a customer coming in, a client, or anyone entering your workplace. So that could be a postal carrier, a delivery person, a um, no anybody, a UPS guy that fills the pop machine, you know, anybody. Um, so, for example, at my last employer, we had a, a customer at the um, credit union that was coming into the branch to do personal banking transactions, and the customer kept asking one of our tellers about the date, and she kept saying no. And the customer kept asking and asking the teller out, and each time she'd say no, and each time the customer was getting a little bit more assertive and graphic he started making comments like, but you're so beautiful, I'll give you what you need. You've never been in with anyone like me before. And um, finally, the, the teller told the manager about her situation, and the manager talked to the customer and asked him to stop uh, these conversations and interactions with the employee because it was making her uncomfortable. So the next time the customer came in, although he went to a different teller, he still had to say something. He yelled across uh, the teller line and said, your manager told me to stay away from you. You don't know what you're missing. And he said, I'll get you someday, which she wasn't sure if that was get you like um, violence or if that was get you like, um, you know, I'll get you to go out on a date with me. But it was difficult to interpret, and that scared her. So at that point, the employee felt threatened. And she talked to her manager, which is the right thing to do, and the manager contacted me in HR. I spoke with the executive over that area as well as our CEO, and the end result was that um, we restricted the that customer service to the branch. They weren't allowed to go into the branch before. They had to do everything remote uh, because of what we felt that threatening behavior was. So that's how we handled it in that particular situation. Um, and again, uh, that's a harasser that was a customer of the company. Uh, so you have to deal with all those situations very seriously. Um, a victim can also be anyone affected by the offensive conduct. That third bullet point there, an indirect victim is one who's not the direct target of the harassment. Um, they're simply in the vicinity of the harassment, directed to another person, and they're affected by the harassment. In this situation, the victim must pers personally witness the harassment, which was directed at others. Um, and the harassment has to occur in the victim's immediate work environment. So. Someone couldn't be a victim if they simply heard of harassing behavior occurring at the company or, you know, through the grapevine or something. That That's not a victim of harassment. They have to physically be there witnessing the hostile work environment. There was an interesting case example of indirect harassment. Uh, it was Miller versus the California Department of Corrections. The California Supreme Court ruled by unanimous decision that employees under certain circumstances may have a claim for unlawful hostile work environment sexual harassment when a supervisor shows favoritism to his or her coworkers with whom the supervisor is involved in a sexual or romantic relationship. So in this specific case, two former employees of the Valley State Prison of Women sued the California Department of Corrections for sexual harassment, complaining about the conduct of the warden. The warden apparently had sexual relationships with at least three female employees. Um, the plaintiffs were not sexually involved with the warden, but the claim was the warden granted unwarranted and unfair employment benefits to the three women that he was involved with. 
So all this, uh, although this case expanded the scope of hostile work environment, the court stated that the mere office gossip or an isolated instance of favoritism by a supervisor toward a subordinate employee he or she is having a consensual uh, sexual relationship with will not constitute unlawful ser- sexual harassment of other coworkers. So it, again, it still has to be severe and pervasive enough um, or affecting uh, job benefits, in which case um, in this particular suit, uh, they did win. Um, so last bullet point there, someone may be a victim without economic injury or discharge. Again, this is just a pure claim of hostile work environment if they're, uh, it's not quid pro quo, it's hostile work environment. So it's important to note um, when we're giving examples that harassment can occur outside of your physical building. Um, Discrimination and harassment covers the workplace, quote unquote, the workplace, which is any place within the course and scope of employment. So this would include uh, a working lunch outside of the office, client calls, uh, outside training, Um, Here's an interesting, far-reaching example. There was a case, uh, Parrish versus Salicito, I believe is how you say it. It was in um, New York in 2003 where uh, the court ruled against an employer in a sexual harassment case because the employer had failed to impose discipline on an employee. So in this Parrish case, an employee attended a reception following a funeral of a relative of another employee. And while they were at the reception, a manager sat next to the employee and placed his hand on her dress and rubbed her leg. And when um, this activity was reported, the employer failed to take appropriate action. So in making the decision against the employer, the court reasoned that conduct arose in the workplace because the employee's attendance at their funeral reception was an extension of the necessary social obligation and unstated expectations that are common adjuncts of various events and interactions associated with the normal place of business. So in other words, the court appeared to be stating that if there had not been a work relationship, the opportunity for the inappropriate conduct would not have existed. So workplace is very broad, Uh, so keep that in mind when you're addressing situations, um, we have to keep our antennas up um, with everything that goes on in terms of um, interactions between our employees and what's considered work-related situations. So at this point, uh, we've Uh, talked about harassment in terms of sexual harassment, although harassment as a form of discrimination still applies to the other protected classes that we talked about, which are race, age, disability, national origin, and religion. So let's talk about a couple of case examples so you understand the other forms of harassment. Uh, There was a case, Allen versus the Michigan Department of Corrections. Um, Albert Allen was an African-American male employed by the Michigan Department of Corrections. And this was back in, uh, gosh, it started in 1989. Um, So in September of 1989, the black officers were transferred out of cell block 8 since, quote, unquote, it was not customary for black officers to work on cell block 8. So in and of uh, itself, that is um, discrimination. But... The story goes on. Um, Allen filed a grievance and was transferred back to the area. So um, this is when his problems began. Um, Allen was subjected to several racial slurs, um, inward. Um, he also received death threats signed by the KKK. Um, Allen was also told that the N-word can't be trusted and that he would never be promoted because he would not, quote, unquote, play ball. Uh, Further, Allen was told by a manager that he was lazy like the rest of his people and that is why they are all in prison, end quote. 
On one occasion, one of the white officers working with Allen cut the lock off of this locker. Um, Allen uh, scored higher on his testing than white officers, uh, but he was still passed up for promotion. Allen was also monitored more closely than the white officers and was threatened with reprimands when there was no reason to believe that he had been one, of the, one to commit a violation of a rule. And on one occasion, his logbook was even altered to make it look like he was taking long lunches, and he, then he was reprimanded for supposedly taking long lunches. So obviously in this case, the court applied the same standards for harassment as um, previous sexual harassment claims and found that race racial hostile environment existed. And that's pretty severe and pervasive, I would say. There was another case. Um, it was the EEOC versus UPS of America. And this was recent. In 2012, a victim claimed harassment for being Jordanian and Muslim. So that's national origin and religion discrimination. The uh, U.S. Uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission filed a lawsuit against UPS of America for allowing supervisors and coworkers to discriminate and harass an employee for being Jordanian and, and Muslim. The employee was a loader at UPS in San Francisco and uh, faced verbal and physical harassment. Uh, he was often referred to by supervisors and coworkers as, quote, Dr. Bomb quote, Al-Qaeda, and quote, Taliban. The EEO said in a statement um, that also he was assaulted with rocks. They would throw rocks at him, throw bottles at him, tools at him, and he also had a dead mouse uh, placed in his lunch sack. Uh, what made it worse was UPS management ignored it. And they failed to take action after the employee reported the harassment and he was involuntarily transferred. So uh, he told them about it and they transferred him to another workstation. And then he was subjected to additional scrutiny from management. So they made his life hard. So clearly that was harassment and discrimination. So those are a few examples outside of sexual harassment. Now let's talk about what are harassing and discriminatory behaviors. Um, we've talked about quite a few of them in our cases that we've reviewed, but it's important to have a clear understanding of the verbal, physical, and printed or electronic means of unacceptable behaviors. So verbal conduct includes derogatory comments, jokes, slurs, uh, unwelcome comments or invitations. Physical conduct includes unwelcome touching, assault, blocking normal movement or interfering with work. Uh, just as a side note, one of the things that seemed to come up quite a bit and in my experiences is um, shoulder rubbing. Um, I don't know why, but people like to rub each other's shoulders. And if somebody is not comfortable with that, um, that should be included in your physical list and have it be known it's not acceptable. Um, let's see, offensive printed or written materials includes emails, obviously, instant messages, if you have instant messages that you use at work, um, texts, social networking posts, blog posts, comments on websites. Um, also, uh, Accessing or storing offensive graphics or pornographic data on your computer, company phone, or electronic device. Um, that can be harassing or discrimination, particularly when it's seen by others, discovered. Um, generally, those are in policies to say that you can't have those things on your computer. If not, I would highly recommend adding that. So um, anti-retaliation clauses are in discrimination logs, and it makes it unlawful to discriminate against an employee or a job ac applicant due to the fact that the individual has opposed any practice engaged in by the employer alleged to be unlawful or because the employee or job applicant has filed a charge. Um, or if they have testified, assisted, or participated in any manner in 
an investigation or a proceeding or a hearing. So there's two uh, anti-retaliation clauses. One is uh, the opposition, opposition clause, and it states that anyone who threatens to file a Title VII charge of discrimination against an employer or opposes any practice of the employer believed to be unlawful is protected by Title VII. So this is even if the employee is wrong and no unlawful act was in fact committed by the employer. So as long as the employee made the allegation in good faith and the allegation was based upon a reasonable belief that the employer had violated Title VII, then the individual who threatened to file the charge of discrimination is protected. So you cannot take adverse action against an employee that makes a claim or is part of an investigation of a claim. So that's the opposition clause. So you have to be very careful. This happens quite a bit. And we're going to talk about some examples of these clauses. The next clause is the participation clause. So on the other hand, it provides um, employee with the absolute protection from any retaliatory acts by an employer if the individual actually does file a charge with the EOC or participates in an EOC investigation in any way. So in the participation clause, even if the employee knows that the employer has not committed an unlawful act and files a charge against the employer anyway, so they're essentially doing it on purpose when they know nothing was committed, that employee is still protected. So there's no good faith or reasonable belief requirements uh, needed to exist under the participation clause, unlike the opposition clause. So keep that in mind. Um, you may be frustrated or, and or angry about the situation, but you cannot retaliate. So um, although retaliation obviously includes any action that you take with the intent to harm or punish an employee for complaining, it can also include actions that you take with the best of intentions. So if those actions have a negative impact on the employee, even though you had the best intentions, it can be seen as anti-retaliation. So let's look at an example. A female employee complains that her supervisor is sexually harassing her. In response, you change the employee from the day shift to the night shift so that she doesn't have to work with the supervisor anymore. So even though you didn't intend to hurt the employee, this action could be retali uh, retaliatory if the employee preferred the day shift. So here's another example. An African-American employee complains to you that the store in which he works is racially hostile toward him because his coworkers tell racial jokes and call him racial, uh, racially derogatory names. So in response, you transfer the employee to another store. So this action could be retaliatory if the new store is farther from the employee's home or if the position is less desirable in some way. So if the employee actually requests the transfer and agrees to changes in location or shift and or position, be sure to have that employee sign an acknowledgement form that his or her transfer was requested uh, by them and it's not adverse action. Um, so an employee's... Um, Let's see, compensation, their benefits, their seniority, their eligibility for promotion must remain. Um, and transferring an employee is not necessarily the ultimate solution. You must still investigate the issue um, in the department that the employee was working. Otherwise, those issues could continue and um, create a hostile work, a work environment for others. So simply transferring somebody isn't uh, the end-all, be-all uh, to fixing the problem. So reporting investigation and discipline, what do you do uh, when a situation comes up? Um, certainly the company cannot correct what it does not know about. Um, yes, it is the duty of the employee to report discrimination or harassment. However, the law 
has said that it's extremely important that you as supervisors create a culture of openness within your company. So employees must feel encouraged to discuss their concerns, whether they're a victim or a witness. Otherwise, you have a situation that continues on and on and on and nobody says anything, and then it becomes a hostile work environment. Your policy and practice should permit employees to report concerns to any member of management. So let's look at an example here. Say you have a policy that states that the employee should first go to their supervisor, yet it's the supervisor that's the harasser. So the EEOC in a court will find no defense for an employer in this case because they're going to the person that's the harasser. So you have to have... Um, a policy that allows them to go to whoever they feel comfortable with, and that will help create your open communication culture. The EOC has some guidelines um, for it. It's on their, their website, and in those guidelines, it says an employer must take immediate actions on claims. So what is immediate? The courts have further defined that to say that investigations should begin within the hour. Within the hour. So not taking immediate action results in strict liability, meaning that employer is automatically liable, even if it wasn't intentional, if they don't act immediately. So it's critical that the investigating party, parties not disclose the investigation with anyone that's not uh, that doesn't need to know as well, so like peers. So as a manager, if it comes to you, you don't talk to anybody that doesn't need to be involved uh, with the situation. Um, <clears throat> employees may bring forth a complaint, but then tell you, but don't say anything. I don't want to cause any problems happens quite a bit. And in this situation, I say, okay, let them know that in order to investigate and take action to correct the situation, you must report the concern to the appropriate person and investigate their concern. And it's really difficult to keep full anonymity of their identity during the investigation because, um, you know, the details and the persons involved must be allowed to respond to the claim. You also want to ask the person to maintain the confidentiality during the investigation to, um, for, for their benefit to avoid further harassment, um, also intimidation and retaliation, and to keep evidence from being destroyed to ensure that you know, their testimony is not fabricated or other people's testimony is not fabricated and to prevent a cover-up. And always ask them, um, to come to you or, if you know, if another investigator is um, named to, to bring forth any further concerns. You need to know what's going on if there's any, anything more happening. So the courts have stated that uh, appropriate action must be taken on the harasser. So after the investigation, if any degree of harassment is found to exist, the harasser must receive at least some disciplinary action for the illegal behavior. So at the very least, this would be a written warning, including a reminder of the company policy against harassment and that further harassing behavior would result in termination. There are no second chances. If the individual commits harassing behavior again, it must result in termination. This would also be a good time for the harasser to go through training again. Obviously, it didn't stick the first time. And if the behavior is flagrantly offensive, then the harasser should be terminated. And, um, and flagrant would be physical acts of violence, threats, exposing themselves, aggressive touching, things like that. You can tailor the punishment for the crime, of course, but if it's flagrant, you have to take appropriate actions. And um, it's always good if, uh, you have a situation come up, uh, you're concerned about uh, whether the action um, fits the crime, your, your employment action fits the crime, consult with your attorney on an opinion. So after the uh, investigation and 
disciplinary action is taken, you want to communicate with the victim so they know that the situation has been corrected. The victim needs closure, and they need to find a peace of mind and comfort in the workplace again. You, you need to bring some normalcy back to the atmosphere and the work environment and continue to build your culture of openness and strong employee relations. So that's very important to communicate back to the victim. So let's talk about here quickly at the end about uh, liability. Uh, High-ranking officials are automatically imputed liability. So what does that mean? If you're an officer of the company, a president, an owner, a partner, or anyone in a high-level decision-making role, uh, and you commit discrimination or harassing action, the illegal actions are automatically imputed to the company. So there's no defense there. You're guilty. Uh, and keep in mind that high-ranking officials, so executives, uh, board members, things like that, are the company. They are considered the company. So a supervisor, um, if they have adverse action, it's uh, or quid pro quo. So if a supervisor commits quid pro quo, it's strictly liable, meaning that the company is liable for the supervisor's actions regardless of negligence or intent. So even though they didn't intend to, I didn't mean to, I didn't know, um, it's still strictly liable. Keep in mind, too, that uh, supervisors in uh, most states have personal liability. So the company can be named in a lawsuit, but a supervisor can be and generally would be named personally um, in a lawsuit for quid pro quo adverse action decisions. Also, for coworkers, agents, and non-employees, there's a known or should have known standard. So what does this mean? It means that if an employer knew or should have known that such individuals, so these outside individuals, coworkers, agents, non-employees, were sexually harassing employees and the employer failed to take action or reasonably act on their knowledge or of uh, complaints, they would be liable for the, the employer is liable for the negligence. So you have to have your antennas up all the time. You have to create an atmosphere of open communication so you know what's going on. Okay, so you know now what discrimination and harassment is and your liability. So let's talk about your responsibility as an employer. And when we say employer, we mean the highest decision maker must take these actions or at least delegate these actions to prevent and address discrimination and harassment. If you are responsible for human resources in your organization, then, then you should take this to your manager and manager's manager, CEO, to let them know of the company's responsibility. So the EEOC has some published guidelines for prevention and in a nutshell, it covers policy and grievance procedure and training. So I'm just going to read through their bullet points that are on their website, what they say an employer must do. And this is, falls under this clear communication of intolerableness and then immediate and appropriate action on claims. So they say you must raise the subject and discuss it with your employees. You must express strong disapproval of such acts. You must define illegal harassment for employees. You must establish and publicize an appropriate policy and reasonable grievance procedure to be used to bring concerns to the attention of the company. You must inform employees of their rights under Title VII and seriously and effectively investigate all suspected acts of illegal harassment and act to rem remedy the problem in a reasonable manner. So when it comes to training, it's recommended that the employer train all employees, but also train supervisors separate, separately on their responsibilities, which is what we're doing today. And it's recommended that all employees review and sign off on the policy. So you need to have a policy, you need to have your training, and you want to document um, that they've signed off, uh, they completed the training, and they've signed off and acknowledged the policy. So as a supervisor, what do you do? 
uh, well, you need to be fully versed on the company policy. And if you don't have a policy, you need to create one. Um, talking to the highest official at your organization, ask for one. Uh, and then you need to comply with the policy. You're a, you're a model for your employees, so you need to create the culture that is free of discrimination and harassment. So you need to watch what you do and watch what you say. If you have any concerns, you contact your manager or your human resources or legal support immediately with any claims that come forward. So if you have a claim that comes forward, what do you do? Listen first. Take notes. Document what they told you. Contact your manager immediately. Um, then your manager is going to investigate um, with whether it's HR or legal support or other management. And if the illegal behavior is occurring in your department or scope of your oversight, then you'll be highly involved in the investigation. So you better be prepared to rearrange your schedule. Um, again, you have to act immediately. And then you'll need to work with your manager or HR in determining disciplinary action of the harasser if they're in your department, as well as communicate back to the victim if the victim is in your department. We have some supporting um, policies, investigation guidelines. And so we have a sample harassment and discrimination policy, as well as a sample EEO and non-discrimination policy, and then investigation steps and consideration. So wh what do you do when a claim comes forward, and what questions do you ask? So hopefully you'll find this information useful. And um, I've also included uh, my contact information. If you have any other questions, feel for free to send me an email, uh, give me a call. Uh, we provide other HR services as well, so I can help point you in the right direction. I want to thank everybody for being on the call today. And again, if you have any questions that uh, you want to ask now, feel free to ask. Those that are interested in listening to the answers can stay on the line, or you can send me an email with any questions as well. So I'll hand it back over to Amanda to close the session, and, uh, if, unless we have any questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Jen. So, yes, as Jen mentioned, the floor is open for questions. If you um, have any questions you'd like to have answered today, please go ahead and fill out, um, uh, send it either with the chat feature or the Q&A feature. I will also go ahead and open up a poll so you can give us your feedback. And hopefully you um, took the opportunity uh, before logging in today to download the supporting materials that Jenna so kindly provided. If you did not get an opportunity to um, download that information, feel free to email either Jen or myself, and I'd be happy to send you that information. doesn't look like I have any other questions coming in. I know you covered the information very well, and the case studies are always really helpful for people to help uh, wrap their mind around the different types of um, discrimination that really exists in the workplace. So with that, um, I will um, just like to thank everyone today for participating and for and Jen, really, for sharing all the information um, that she has on the subject. A recording of You're the webinar will I'm sorry? You're quite welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks so much for doing this. Um, you're a great resource for us and, and for our clients um, on the topic. That's, that's for sure. There's a lot to learn. <laughs> um, hmm. but we will have a recording available on our website um, at tricom.com. It's under the Resources tab, and just click on the Industry Insider Webinars, and you'll be able to find that information there. Um, again, please feel free to reach out to us if you'd like um, the supporting documents or if you have any other questions. Um, please do watch for information on our next webinar, which will be held on May 22nd, and it is a healthcare update. Thanks again so much. Have a fantastic afternoon.